controlling of people in supply chain management. I say, whatever's on your label, you better do what you say you're doing, whatever it is. And when it comes to uh, writing guidelines, I like clear guidelines. I mean, I can't, I don't know what to do with a guideline that says something like, oh, prevent avoidable suffering. I don't know what that means. And in the meatpacking plants, I made a very, very simple scoring system. How many cattle did you stun on the first shot? This was from McDonald's and the AMI. Unfortunately, sheep weren't in, but you take the same principle. How many animals did you stun correctly on a single shot? If they couldn't make 95% on a single shot, they failed the audit, period. Traffic rules. Everything dead before you cut anything up. Uh, no more than 1% falling. No more than 3% mooing in the stun box. Outcome-based measures. I call it traffic rules for meatpacking plants. I find on a lot of things, people want to go into overly complicated stuff that's so complicated nobody can understand. In fact, if any of you are working on you know, animal welfare supply chain management stuff, I have a book called Improving Animal Welfare, a Practical Approach. This is aimed at somebody that's actually in supply chain management. How do we set up simple but strict you know, guidelines? I call it you know, like traffic rules. But I find a lot of people on writing guidelines, they like all this complicated stuff. And what you gotta figure out, what are the right things to enforce? Okay, let's go back to traffic rules. This is the critical control point approach. If you could enforce only five traffic rules, which five would you enforce to get maximum public safety? And which one of those things would be big number one? When I ask this question, usually big number one doesn't come up first. Five things. And we got you know, a little budget problem with police departments. You're only allowed to enforce five things. But if you enforce these five things, you're gonna get 95% of the safety. Okay, what would, what would you enforce? Speed, yep, and that's one of them. Drunk driving, yep, that's definitely one of them. Yeah, the texting, yep, that would be one of them. Yeah, that would be, uh, that'd be very critical, but usually we don't have to enforce that. Because <laughs> you're gonna be getting <laughs> any stoplights and seatbelts. If you think about it, if you just really hard enforce those things, those are critical control points. It's the same principle you have in food safety. They can't measure everything. Okay, when the pilot does his checklist before he flies, I'm going on a plane tomorrow, hopefully Buffalo won't have a sleet storm, I, he goes through the checklist. It does not have a hundred things on it. it, it you, because you, he's only going over the things that are really important. And I think it's real interesting that there's three things that have really sensible legislation, and nobody's ever gonna squabble about this in Congress. Traffic rules, aviation safety stuff, and elevator rules. <laughs> nobody wants to get stuck in the elevator, and nobody wants to die in a car or a plane. Really keeps it based in reality. We're not gonna be repealing the stop signs anytime soon. That's just not gonna happen. Well, that's the approach I like to take down when we're looking at animal welfare things. What are the important things? Now, the thing you've got to remember today is every phone is a TV station. This is a new era. And here's a situation where a movie really got in a lot of trouble, A Dog's Purpose, nice Disney movie, and uh, they were throwing a German Shepherd for the filming into a pool with eight outboard motors churning up the water, and this dog was terrified. Uh, not nice at all and it went totally viral. I don't know what they were thinking. And there's one thing that when the HBO movie was made, I supervised personally, and that was those dip vents. And Mark supervised the other one. We actually took over B Crew, and we ran those dip vents. I wasn't up there with Claire Danes. I was down, down there with a welder, putting back an anti-drowning gate that Mick Jackson had taken off because he wanted more splashing. I said, I don't want more splashing. Those are real dip vets. They were real. They didn't have chemicals in them. But other than that, they were real. And real cattle can drown. Wasn't going to let that happen. And the dog's purpose uh, totally got messed up by uh, 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 stupid. They should have used a fake dog to throw in those rabbits. Because another thing that they movie, that my movie had, Mick Jackson won best one camera editing. You can do a fake dog in there, and it looks totally real if you do, if you do your editing right. Okay. Let's get into animal welfare stuff. 
nice and basic and simple, the way I like it. The first thing is you have to make sure you don't have abuse and neglect. You know, like some sheep with some horrid, you know, rotten, prolapsed uterus, uh, somebody's picking them up by the wool and throwing them. I mean, just this bad stuff. You gotta make sure you don't have that stuff. We gotta remember every cell phone is a camera. You cannot get away from it. You think you banned cell phones? Then you really are smoking weed if you think you can get rid of all the cell phones. <laughs> I have plenty of weed around here to smoke. <laughs> and you're, you're not going to get rid of that, and you're not going to get rid of cell phones either, that's for sure. <laughs> so once we make sure that we're not doing something really awful that would look terrible on the phone, let's look at some of the outcome-based measures. I'll take handling, for example. I score things like how many sheep rear on top of each other, how many sheep fell down, how many crashed into something. I can score that in cattle vocalization scoring during handling wards, but it doesn't work in sheep. They're the ultimate prey species animal, and they don't want to advertise that you know, they're hurting. But other measurements we can do is body condition score, lameness. If they're indoor sheep, do they, are they dirty? There's all the animals dirty, and there's dirtiness scoring. Uh, if they're in some kind of indoor thing, they have swollen hocks, like maybe some of those dairy cows get. Um, those are simple animal-based outcome measures. One of the things we've learned in the beef and pork packing plants is we're using these outcome measures on handling, which is electric prod score, falling, vocalization score, that we made some pretty shabby old facilities work. We did a lot of repairs, a lot of non-slip flooring, and a lot of stuff with lighting. It's amazing what you can do with lighting. They don't like to go in the dark, they don't like reflections, they don't like things that move. Um, but measuring simple things. I don't know what avoidable suffering is. I, all this abstract stuff, uh, and then they talk about well, you gotta have a competent authority. Well, what is that? What's a competent authority? I don't know, I've worked 20 years in construction. I and mean, one of the reasons why we were able to do a low bidder contract and not have it messed up is we weren't abstract about it. We didn't write a whole book full of specs either. And then, what I want to do in just a few minutes is open it up to just a whole old tons of questions. <coughs> oh, let's get back to the students I talked to yesterday. We had 20, two different, like two, two, two hour labs, 20 students. And I started asking them, what do you want to do? Why, is, why are you getting an animal science degree? I want to be a veterinarian. And I go to New Mexico State, I go to Texas A&M, they'll tell you the same thing. Okay, why does everybody want to be a veterinarian? because that's the only animal career they've been exposed to. And I've been asked all the time, how did I get interested in cattle? I was exposed to them in high school. I was an Easterner originally. Students get interested in careers they get exposed to. And that includes the Fermi Lab. You know, they got interested in it because a high school science teacher made physics interesting. Now we need to be reaching out to students. And I told the students, try on careers. Do every internship you can go out and do. Find the stuff you like. Find the stuff you hate. And then what happens, by junior year, the amount that want to be vexed drops to about 20, 25% at our school and at other places too. Because they've now discovered pigs. One girl discovered breeding pigs. I talked to, I talked to four students this year that tried pigs out, and three loved them and one hated them. And then another student tried out the um, Meat quality at the, one of the big beef plants, really like that, hated the credit union internship. Somebody else is going to be just the opposite. It's important for them to try on jobs. As expensive as education is today, they need to figure out where they want to go. I also told them, get on the biology department uh, website. Get on the crop science website, the wildlife website. Look at other courses. You know, get outside of the animal science box and maybe you'll find something else. Let's put some plant science together with some animal science. You know, we need to be getting those animals and the land together. It was really good that two years ago at our international symposium, they invited in a crop scientist. I learned something I didn't know, you know, from that crop science. The bison created the land in Iowa and Illinois. I thought that was really uh, pretty cool. What I think I want to do right now is we're going to just open up the whole pond of discussion. Because that's a lot more interesting than just me talking. Now, if nobody has any questions, I'm going to pick somebody. <laughs> somebody better get their hand up now. Okay, who am I going to pick? I tend to like bright colors. 
red shirt right here. <laughs> and nobody can attract the bright colors. Okay, I'll ask you. <laughs> you don't have a question? Internationally, okay, let's talk about that. All right, let's talk about how I started out my career. I, when I started out in Arizona cattle, one of my very first jobs was I wrote for the Arizona Farmer Ranchman magazine, and I, I had to talk my way into the Arizona cattle feeders meeting because they didn't think women should go to it. They to bring that up. I managed to talk my way in, and I proved that I could write a really accurate article on all the different talks. But then I started just looking at the industry from the viewpoint of the Arizona Cattle Feeders Association. And I was in for a rude awakening when I went to Australia in 1978. That would have been probably five years later. And also I started traveling to the Midwest and some other parts of the U.S. Travel's a great educator. And at the time that I was writing for the Fire Ranchman, there was a big scandal where somebody had brought some kangaroo meat into the U.S. This is in the 70s. Not now, 70s. I'm going very close. I'm about 70s. And so I expected to go down to Australia and see some really awful meat plants and some awful stuff. And I had been invited down there by the Australian lot cow feeders. I walked into like three gorgeous, they call them meat works. And I'm going, wow, these put us to shame. That was a real shock. You know, you get out and uh, look at other things. Now, I've been to some other places where the plants were outside the U.S. were disgusting. But going on that trip to Australia, and then I went to a trip to Europe, and I got to see the very nice pork plants in Denmark. Travel is a great educator. It really broadens your perspective. And we got talking about this at this international symposium that we do for students. And one of the things that they really liked that I talked about was the fact that my perspective changed. When I, had, when I got outside of the Arizona cattle feeders industry, oh yeah, we had a great, great industry. Cattle do great. This brings up another thing, which I think affected where my career went. In Arizona in the 70s, cattle handlers, beyond atrocious, just atrocious. But the feed yards were a really nice environment for the cattle. They had shades, they stayed dry. I was not exposed to cattle slogging around in filth. And I'm getting to, I call my cattle foreman computers. And I'd seen cattle slogging around in filth uh, when I first started. I probably would have had a dim view of feed yards. I saw a cattle handling as something I could fix. But slogging around in filth, I, no. They stayed dry, they stayed clean, I, they had shade, they had plenty of space. I, living conditions in the 70s in Arizona feedlots were excellent. You know, and I think that affected maybe where my career went. Then I went to Illinois in the 80s, and I saw him slogging around the mud, and particularly like that. Right okay. Got oh, okay, you got a mic. Okay, great. Dr. Brandon, you talked about um, nebulous terms. What do you think about this idea of sustainability? Well, the problem with sustainability is how do you define it? I almost sometimes, on um, things like that, would rather define it with some really obvious examples of what it's not. Okay, hog lagoon is leaking into the river. Okay, that'd be something you very clearly be not sustainable. You took your sheep out there and just stripped the pasture. You know, you wouldn't do that now. In the past, I saw that in the 70s where sheep and cattle stripped the pastures. I've also seen grazing done right. I think sometimes it's better to almost define it by what you should absolutely not do. Because when I do an animal welfare score, we have our things we score. And then you have some stuff you just don't ever do like pick sheep up by the wool and throw them, for example. They have massive bruises, so they're picked up by the wool. That's something that, that you should never do. I, you have, uh, you know, there's some things on treatment of workers. You know, you think of things in that you shouldn't do. And when I was doing McDonald's audits in, in China and other countries, uh, we were there for welfare, but I did some safety stuff. Three poultry plants down in South America said, you get a safety shut off line. All you have to do is put a cable to a switch. So if someone shackles their finger in a poultry shackle, they don't lose a finger. The big accidents, they're easy to prevent. You get a guardrail on a, on a chain drive. You get that auger covered up and uh, put a handrail on a catwalk that's 10 foot above the ground. 
you know, somebody doesn't fall off that catwalk. You know, I said, we gotta do a little human welfare. Another thing I did is I always made sure I had to use the ladies' room when I was right next to the employees' bathroom because I wanted to see, make sure the employees were not living in some absolute hole. I don't expect it to be totally like, a, you know, as good as some of our stuff, but it's gotta be clean and I can think of. Well, you see, I, I think visually, I'm seeing a house. This is like, this is, I again, was back in the 80s. Went down to Mexico and went to a cattle ranch. And this, there was a toilet in this house that uh, absolutely was not acceptable. I won't go into any more. It's sort of like, let's start out things that absolutely, there's no way you can call sustainable. You know, you're just uh, contaminated groundwater. You're, and I got talking to an oil rig manager about, okay, what would be the critical control points on an oil rig? Number one, don't blow it up. <laughs> okay, don't contaminate groundwater would be another one. Don't cause earthquakes. Don't kill people on your rig. And, and they liked my approach of, instead of getting all kinds of minutiae, let's get into stuff that's really important. And it's not a hundred things. So I think I don't want, since I'm a visual thinker, I'm kind of thinking of things that would not be sustainable. Okay, I've got a, 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 a cattle operation that's just, uh, when it rains, the runoff just goes into the river. Or we know that it's going into groundwater. That is certainly not sustainable. It's also not sustainable to drain the aquifer. That's not sustainable. Saudi Arabia has already drained their aquifer and cannot farm anymore. That's happened. I can remember in the 70s. There's been advantages that have been around for a while. Where they drilled the first wells in Saudi Arabia and they made the desert bloom. They can't make the desert bloom anymore. They've drained it. It will not replenish. It's mining water. That's not sustainable. That's more how I, I'd always rather pick out stuff that I think any sensible person could agree is not a sustainable thing to do. It's just absolutely not sustainable to do that. And one more, is, is there, are there things that the sheep industry can still do today that, that we can do better? I'm sure there's always ways to do better. There's always things to do better. I think, you know, one of the things I think that needs to get done is getting livestock and, and crops together. I went to a very innovative, uh, the Rustler family in Pueblo, Colorado. I stayed in their house, it was really fun. He took me out and showed me his pinto beans and some new crop harvesting equipment. He's integrating cattle into his crop rotations. We need to be doing more uh, varied crop rotation. They're doing a lot of that in Europe. You know, the sheep can be part of that. And then of course there's a predator problem, which is such a hot potato that uh, it's difficult to discuss in public. <laughs> I really like the hate emails. <laughs> and this is the problem with a lot of things, is how do we have rational discussion? This is where social media makes it worse. Because I don't care what issue it is, social media magnifies the voice of the far right and the far left, and the more sensible heads in the middle just get trashed but on both sides. But I'm kind of thinking of a specific situation, this Rustler farm, I really liked some of the stuff they were doing. You know, and, and gradually, we're, and I went to, that was fun, I went to plant science meeting this summer. That was really fun. And we talked about uh, how to make crops more sustainable. Talked to a lot of scientists privately at the poster session, and they all agreed, we need to be doing a lot more on rotating crops. But we're not doing that. I mean, in the future, we have to do more of that. There's a lot of things that are being learned about the ground and how different things interact with the ground. I was reading some articles in Science and Nature about that. There's a lot of things. We need to be uh, much more cross-disciplined. So I said to the students, why don't you find out what the biology buildings do? We're building this new biology building. And I walked by it when it was just this, the, the framework was just going up, and the sign said it was the biggest major on campus. You know, oh, that's interesting. That night I looked at the web page. They were doing all kinds of interesting things on sustainability. They didn't know about my own campus. Well, this is where I said to the students, get out there and, and look at some other departments. Maybe take a course in over at crop science or wildlife, you know, so we're not so much in the bubble. And that's the kind of stuff we've got to do. When I started out, I was totally in the bubble. Um, I, oh, okay, up on there, okay. On that same vein, we have, you were talking about every, Cameras, every phone is a TV camera, and social media. 
And we have a whole lot of people who have picked up on certain concepts and then that runs with it. How can what we- What do you mean certain concepts? Well, it's not the Certain here. concepts as in, for instance, one of those would be raised antibiotic free. And the, the definition of that in some, in some industries, and we as, we as producers, we as consumers, who know how that really is. We need to do a better job of, of conveying that message, and how can we do that? Well, the thing is, the, uh, I, actually, I actually like European organic rules. When I was doing the second edition of Improving Animal Welfare Practical Approach, they have a, had a veterinarian do a chapter on the organic rules, and when our organic rules, you're not allowed to use any antibiotics. In Europe, mass medication is forbidden. The treatment of individual sick animals is allowed with double the withdrawal. For example, if the label said 30 days, then it would be 60. And I like that. I've seen too many untreated lice, coughing cattle, I've seen some nasty stuff with that. And, but on the other hand, uh, you might want to try these keywords. Go on Google Scholar. How many people here know how to use Google Scholar? I think everybody here needs to learn how to use Google Scholar. Google Scholar is the scientific internet. It takes you out of all the rubbish, takes you into journal articles and technical papers. To get into it, all you do is type scholar into Google, and then you'll see a link that says Google Scholar. And when you click on that, a new search box comes up. But it only takes you into scientific journals. And uh, I recommend that you get that search box up and you type in soil and antibiotics, manure and antibiotics. There's stuff going on with transfer of resistance when we're dumping this much antibiotics out onto the soil. They're scary papers. Now some of them, you'll just get the abstracts and then you'll hit a paywall, and then you need to get a friend at a university to get you the paper. Or you go back to regular Google and write to the professor. Or you click on the thing that says, see all six versions. And if ResearchGate comes up, you're in luck. Because you can get around the paywall. But I think you'll find that Google Scholar is a wonderful thing because the summaries of scientific papers are always free. Always. You can always read the summaries for free. And, and uh, some of these stuff, you know, Chinese pig farm, uh, massive amounts of antibiotics dumped on the soil, weird stuff going on. That, there's a big difference between doing that and treating some indi a few individual sick pigs. Big difference. We're putting this stuff out on the land. That's where we got to worry about. You can look these papers up yourself. I looked them up. Manure and antibiotics, soil and antibiotics. Uh, the other thing you got to remember is that the resistant genes are ancient. They've always been there. They're lurking there in the soil, mixed with the stuff we throw out there on the soil. So the sensible thing to do, and I mean the sensible, is you have to cut back on it. That's a big difference between doing that and banning it. Totally big difference. Because I want cattle with lice to be treated. I'm scared to death that we'll get um, uh, worm flies back. Oh, hard. Be worms coming out of their back. Oh, yes. Wild cattle. You get a bunch of super wild cattle in from Mississippi. They have 50 grubs popping out of their back. And they just love it when you, when you pop their zits. And you have to wait for they're ripe so you don't mash the worm in the back. Otherwise, you get infected. Coke bottle works great. You just shove it over the zip and the worm pops out. Well, you've got young people today in organics, they don't even know these disgusting things exist. And then Ivermet came in, in the mid 80s, and that got rid of it. So, like, good riddance. And I just found out we just got a case of screwworm in Florida. We don't want those horrible things back. I, uh, yeah, a lot of you are old enough to remember, now I'll be 70 this summer, and uh, I'm old enough to remember some of those nasty things that you don't want back. Okay? <coughs> well, maybe we'll wait for the mic to come around. Okay, now it's working. Okay. Dr. Cool. Grana, thank you for the work that you did on the sheep handling video. Uh, you, nobody globally has more experience on that, on animal welfare, than you do. Do you see any changes on the animal welfare 
on the, on the horizon of the future that might affect our, our industry? Well, the, where you have the most contention in animal welfare is a more intensively raised animals. It's going to be sows, pigs, and egg layer chickens. One advantage sheep have is that they're more extensive, so there's less issues. Now, there's the issues always of painful procedures. Now, one of the things about sheep, since they're the ultimate prey species animal, they have a tendency to cover up the fact that they hurt. So if you want to study their behavior to see if they hurt, you've got to spy on them with video cameras because they won't do it in front of you. Cattle do it to a lesser extent. Uh, you squeeze the cattle too hard to squeeze you, he'll say, ouch. You do that to the sheep, it, it doesn't say, ouch. Now, if you separate the lamb from the ewe or you get them separated, then they, they scream a big fit. But you see, that's separation distress. That's a separate brain system from saying ouch because you did something that hurt them. And that's why people sometimes say, well, sheep are fine one day, dead the next. The problem is that they cover it up. Painful procedures are going to be you know, more and more of an issue. Uh, the thing is, when you look at how the public perceives things, they seem to be more concerned about the painful procedures, <coughs> confining animals in little small places, and how we slaughter them that in chronic conditions like long-term lameness, when it really gets down to animal welfare, let's say a, sh a bunch of sheep in a wet climate with a whole bunch of hoof rot, you're talking about long-term pain. Same thing with lame dairy cows. Yes, and lame dairy cows, their feet do hurt because if you give them pain cures, they stop limping. So that's telling you that their feet are definitely hurting. Uh, the main thing is make sure you don't do stuff like, you know, let a bunch of sheep start to death somewhere. <coughs> Just stupid things. Your big issue is the whole predator thing. That is the thing that's gotten so hot, it's, a, it's very difficult to talk about it in a sensible way. But when I was in that plane, I was a 1978 Baron. And it was the same kind of plane that Sam McElhaney had when we'd fly out to his dip bat when I was doing my first dip bat project. <laughs> And I have to remember that plane. His dog was named Booger, and that whole plane was solid dog hairs. <laughs> so I'm flying out over the outback. The pilot's yakking on a cell phone, and I see the GPS getting off course. So I go, he says, you want to fly this airplane? I go, no, I'm just watching the GPS. <laughs> but the thing I thought about, when you look out over miles of nothing, the only thing you could do with that plane in Australia is to put grazing livestock on. There's not enough water in the ground for crops, there's not enough rain for crops. What are we gonna do, not raise food on some of this land? I think that's crazy, and I think that's the way we've got to approach some of these things. We need to raise food on a lot of this land. There's no way you can crop it. And then there's land, Argentina and South America right now, it's getting dug up, good pasture land, putting monocultures of soy on it. What's so sustainable about that? That's not very sustainable. You know, the vegan stuff has got its problems too. It's, uh, I think we have to, you know, communicate in public. And when I just talk to some of these students, I just say, well, what are we going to do? And then when I tell them things like that, McDonald's and companies like this actually audit animal welfare and slaughter myself, I go, really? McDonald's would do something like that? And I go, yeah. It was very interesting implementing that program. Back in 1999, I was hired to implement it. Teach them the scoring system I had developed. Very simple scoring system. The similar thing is used with beef quality assurance. And I got reactions just like that show, Undercover Boss. <laughs> I got those exact same reactions. And I remember the day, 1999, when a McDonald's executive saw an emaciated, half-dead dairy cow go into their product. And they're going, oh, whoa, man, this is not OK. But then other times when things were fine, they go, oh, yeah, this is OK. Truth's always somewhere in the middle. But then when you get them out in the field, they realize that, um, yeah, there were some things they had to fix. And some other big realer, retailer went out to coffee plantation somewhere. It was horrified with stuff they were doing with the labor. You know, that there's, there's some stuff you got to fix. And it's important for the suits to get out of the office and see that stuff. So it's not theoretical. They can see the stuff that's really bad. They can see some stuff that's probably perfectly OK when it's explained to them. Careful. Uh, 
we move our sheep twice a year, put them on trucks, and they know where they're going. Most of them just march on the truck. Because they know where they're going to feed. No. You see, what happens with the trucks is when they first... They're, they're going from, from winter <laughs> to spring, fall, and back to winter. And no, but it's better to feed. They know where it goes. All, the truckers all have hot shots, and they don't use the button. I'd like to get the hot shots out of their hand. Get the hot shots out of their hand. That, that is one of the things in the packing plants right now. Uh, the rule is get it out of your hand. You can use some other driving aid or flag. You have to go get it if you're going to use it. Or you can have it hang, let's say, right at the truck door. You get one in my book. So you hang it on the fence so it's there. OK, like up at Greeley, for example, last time I was there, they got one battery operated prod. It leaves against the wall. And then if something won't go in, you pick up the prod. And animals are really sensitive. Uh, one day they just had a fan that blows on the people, and someone had turned that fan, it's blowing back down, and shooting cattle would come in. They don't like um, air blowing in their face. It can be handy, but not in their hand. Let's get the hot shots out of their hand. Absolutely, absolutely. And then unfortunately, the OIE really frowns on uh, electric prods on sheep because wool is an insulator. So then they go better when you put it where you should put it. Because that part doesn't have wool on it. <laughs> no, I want to get the hot shots out of the hands. Now, some people would want to ban hot shots. I will never ever say you should ban hot shots. Because if you got if you've got that, if they just keep doing this, that's what I call the automatic pride reflex. That's why you've got to get it out of their hand. Well, you, well I, we've got to stop poking them like that. Yeah, you see, people keep poking. And another problem you know, with driving aids, like with the paddles, I mean, just like doing, doing this on animals. This is one of the things I'm talking to the students yesterday. I said, I don't want you doing this. I want you to take that flag, and you're going to just go. And I showed them how I could just turn the cow's head by taking the flag and just moving it like this, not doing this stuff. And what I have learned on training stock people is about 20% of people, you train them, they've got the, the talent. They like get it, and they'll become really good. There's a bunch of other people you have to uh, monitor all the time. And there's about 10% of people that shouldn't be handling animals because they like to rough them up. And I know that's not nice. And when we were working on, on the meat packing plants, we put video auditing in. <coughs> there's people down in Huntsville, Alabama. They could tune into the Cargill plant, tune into the Greeley plant, see the stunning shoot. What are they doing there? <coughs> kind of many prods they're doing. Too many prods over the score, plant manager gets an email. And when those systems were put in, all the big plants have got them now. Everybody's got them now. 10% of the people driving cattle had to go. They just wouldn't put the hot shot away. The other thing on stockmanship, you cannot understaff and overwork. Absolutely cannot understaff and overwork. When people are too tired, they're going to do bad things. Like you get out for the 10th hour of a 10 hour shift and it's super hot or super cold, they're not going to be doing things right. But having that video auditing, uh, it's really made a difference. Because one of the big problems with cattle is you got to move small groups. Sheep didn't kind of go in continuous flow, but cattle don't work that way. But there's been, they can prove this. When I think back how horrible the handling was in the 70s, oh, there's just no comparison to it. Ruth Bullywoody, who was here today, went out and did a survey of 28 feed yards, and I'm very pleased that the 28 feed yards, when you average a score, we're, on, we're following the BQA recommendations with maybe a, a less than 1% of the cattle falling. Only had about you know 3%, 4% vocalizing. Don't hold me to the numbers. But it, they were really low, single digit numbers. Really good. Big feed yards have uh, improved their handling. They're taking it seriously. And the Beef Quality Assurance Audit has a measurement. Falling score, prod score, vocalization in the squeeze chute. That will not work for sheep, unfortunately. And so if someone's jacked the pressure up too hard and the cattle go, ouch, because you bypassed the pump and squashed them, you know, then you're not going to follow the BQA or you're going to fail the audit for McDonald's. See, I like simple things that you can measure. <coughs> I like measuring him. See, then you can tell, am I getting better or getting worse at him? You've got more, sh lots of sheep falling down, ramming into stuff, and jumping all over the top of each other. Those are things that you can measure. 
And you can see if you're getting better or you're getting worse. <clears throat> well, I'm going to add them with electric prods. Get them out of your hand. Now, you'd have it on a shelf, have it hanging on a nail or something. It's there when you need it. Get it out of your hand. Because otherwise, you're going to use it. Yes, what's your opinion on the wild horse problem in, in the West? Well, that's another hot potato. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, um, I got a text message with a picture attached from Reno on the bottom with wild horses grazing in the housing development. Yeah, in the daytime. And when I went to that same housing development two years ago, there was horse uh, manure all over the housing development. Horses up on the hill didn't dare come in. But then a year later, they're in there in the daytime grazing on the lawns. <coughs> don't have enough to eat. I don't know. These are the kind of problems where you've got people in faraway cities making a big, huge fuss on social media. This is the problem. How do we deal with some of these issues rationally? I mean, I've gotten to the point now where I'm going, you know what, I don't want to get trashed on social media, so I'd rather talk to freshman students about getting good careers <laughs> than discuss wild horses. That's the problem. Now, handling scoring at Mustangs, done that, works really well. Rearing, if you're handling them in a shoot, you rear score them. That's really sensitive if handling starts to go wrong and speed scoring. You shouldn't even be using prods on them. In the dairy industry, they're going to start, um, start eliminating docking of tails. Does the sheep industry have to worry about that? Or? Well, no, docking of tails doesn't really keep them cleaner. See, the problem is when they did the original research, you never did a trimmed tail control, where you just take the scissors and cut the end of the switch off. Because most of the dirt's on the switch. You know, that they, uh, you know, there's some things like that that probably need to get changed. And there's a huge difference in dairies on lanes between your very best dairy and your very worst dairies on how many lane dairy cows you have. And sometimes this is something what I call bad becoming normal. The national average, and this is in several scientific papers, on dairy cow lameness uh, in freestall dairies got up to like 25, 26%. How did it get so bad? See, what happens is it crept up slowly. That's what I call bad becoming normal. Because there's three refereed studies that show that when they asked the dairyman estimate the percentage of lame cows, that was underestimated by half. And then they started to measure it. Bob Kaiserlink at, um, at um, the University of British Columbia started benchmarking it and measuring lameness. And then ranking dairies on the chart. Like a dairy can tell where, where do I, how do I compare with other dairies on the percentage of lame cows. And on high producing cows, and there's also Nigel Cook, uh, University of Wisconsin, it ranges from something like 2 or 3% to 36% between the best dairy and the worst dairy. Huge difference between the best dairy and the worst dairy in, in dairy cow lanes. But the first thing you got to do is you got to measure it. Otherwise, it creeps up on you slowly and you don't realize it's creeped up on you slowly. <laughs> Okay. Is it working? Okay. Um, first of all, thank you very much. I really appreciate your comments about being specific and not um, in. Uh, oh, I hate vague guidelines. And I find that there's a lot of people that want to write vague guidelines. You know what's another problem I've run into with three different species? The worst producers get on the committee and want to water down the standards. That's the other thing. See, my approach is I want to have, you know, like traffic rules. You know, strict but sensible, you know, uh, th and things I can measure and, and train an auditor in a day and a half workshop, you know, the body condition score sheep, lameness score them, and if they're in a feed yard, the dirtiness score them. You know, things that are very easy outcome, what's called an outcome-based measure. I won't tell you how to run your feed lot, clean your feed yard, the outcome. Right ahead. And they're very specific in their learning. Because they could tolerate people behind the exhibit, people in front of the exhibit. When the roofers came to fix the roof, they went berserk and crashed the fence. Because that was something completely novel and new. Well, I think this is something that's super stressful for these animals. 
And, and uh, when I did the, the antelope study, we sent it to a journal, and we had gotten almost baseline levels of cortisol. We got cortisol in the single digits out of that box. So we sent a paper in called title Low Stress Blood Sampling of Bongo. And some reviewer wrote back that the title was judgmental. <laughs> so we had to go to another journal. See, there were certain people that want to admit that when they're taking a sheet of plywood and cramming this animal up against the wall, it was completely freaking out over this. Yeah, some of these animals are dying because they get too scared. Now, I have, I have some ideas on what, from what I've learned in autism on some other drugs that you try too that are not controlled substances like beta blockers, things like that, to try to block some of that fear response. No, it's horrendously stressful. And there's going to be individual differences. And the elk that survive this are the ones that are going to be the easier ones to domesticate because they don't get so scared. Or moose, it doesn't matter what it is. No, it's horribly stressful. You know, it's probably like a PTSD. Back here. Okay. Uh, my question is about the last topic you were talking about, an exposure to new people. In the commercial sheep industry, as small as it is, how are we going to go about getting the exposure we need to get the people interested in, in doing it on a commercial basis? Well, there's a, you know, Steve lavallee has got a sheep class. It'd be good to have some people in the sheep industry uh, come out and talk to the students and uh, uh, take them out there and show them stuff. Have internships. You can talk to Dr. Pond at the Animal Science Department. Have some internships. The only way you're going to get young people involved is to expose them. I was amazed that in 2016, because you know, I've been over like four or five universities doing talks kind of less than I talked to four people who did a pig internship. Three loved it, one hated it. Well, they're not going to know until they do we got to get them out there. Like these students we had here yesterday that were in the beginning livestock practicum class, freshmen and sophomores. You know, get the whole of Steve LaValle, he's a sheep person, <coughs> and I uh, talk to students and get some internships available. Also, I have, I have another life where I talk to people about autism. You know, would really love to stay out in one of those sheep trailers, some guy with mild autism is not very social. And he think living in a sheep trailer was wonderful. <laughs> but he has to be exposed to it. So I see that and I go, oh, I know just some people that think that's wonderful. Be out there with the sheep by themselves? A little solitary? Here you go. <laughs> So I've heard that um, some autistic people are have a, a better connection with animals. Some do. Uh, some do. Not all. Some do. And I know people. There's people that are very, very good at stockmanship, and I'm pretty sure they're on the spectrum. Uh, some some people with uh, autism are really good with animals. Others are not. But I won't know until they try it. You know, this is the thing I've been learning. I've been doing a lot of talks and talking to students about careers and finding out how students get into careers. Exposure in college and high school. They start out 75% wanting to be vets at CSU, at New Mexico State, Michigan State, Texas A&M, K-State, the places I've been, all been in the last two years. And it all gets back to what, and then they get exposed to a lot more things. And the ones that want to be vets drops to like 25%. Because they get exposed to other things in the industry that they find interesting. No, they've got to get students out on the sheep branches and some of these ones that are kind of a, like the solitude. You might find some good stock people there. <coughs> Dr. Grant, and you've been around the livestock uh, and meat industry all your life. And I think when uh, you look at certified Angus beef, I think of somebody who in marketing was genius. Oh, they were genius, absolutely. So what can we do as lamb producers, and I think the lamb board is doing a good job, but how can we... That certified Angus thing started out one little plant at a time. Mm -hmm. I can remember when it started, and Hereford didn't get on board fast enough. One little thing at a time, and it 
grew, and they just kept growing. <coughs> now the downside of Angus is they get hotter than than uh, you know t other pale colored cattle. That's the downside. So the websites you have for us as land producers, and what can the land do to kind of you need the first thing you got to do is you got to what they did is they got a plant, a meat packing plant that would really work with them on marketing a special <coughs> product with their label on it. And it, and it started out and then it just slowly grew and then another plant started you know growing the program. And uh, it took somebody out in the field. All they did was promote that program, promote it to restaurants, promote it to plants. And that person's full-time job, and all they do is just promote that. And then you have to make sure that the cattle that you put into the program are the spec. But it's going to take the first thing you got to do. The thing you got to remember: you got to pull lambs through the system. You don't push them. You pull them through. You pull them through. So let's say you have a special lamb. Well, then you get restaurants to buy that lamb. That's what certified Angus did. They started out. Get restaurants start pulling a few through. And then they get a supermarket doing it. They're pulling more through. It slowly grew. Because I was working in the plants when I watched that program grow. But they did a lot of work with restaurants, start pulling it through. That's what the land board's got to do. Someone's got to be out there beating the bushes, talking to chefs and things like that. But then you've got to have a lamb product that's that's differentiated. See, originally the Angus was differentiated. You know, from the other cat. Oh, so it has to be some special kind of lamb. Okay, this was Angus. You know, it wasn't just plain vanilla. <laughs> and they made a very nice logo. And they also made sure the product was, was consistent. That they didn't put tough product out there, or product out there that wouldn't be very good. No, but it's going to be somebody that's going to have to be riding the airplane. Going to chef conventions, you pull them through. You don't push them through. That's true in anything in supply chain management. You see, then there's starting to be demand for the product. But then you got to figure out what is this lamb going to have that's different from the other lamb. See, that's what Angus did. You see, they made they differentiated their product from just regular beef. See, now we've got all the different niche markets. You know, people say to me, well, what do you think about gap? Five or whatever. I said there's just different niches. Just like craft beer. It's just like the craft beer market. And they've got all these different craft beers. I mean, Fort Collins is like, you know, headquarters for craft beer. And then gradually they pull more product through. Then the problem I see, and they get it in, in is they get more demand than they can produce the product. And then people have cheated. Like uh, grass fed beef that's not grass fed beef. You say it's grass fed beef, then you can't be feeding a grain. You've got to make sure you do what your label says you're doing. And I've worked with people on labels. I was working with one client, I won't say what it was, but I went into the grocery store and I looked at their cage free eggs and they had um, chicken pictures on the egg carton of chickens grazing. The chickens didn't go outside. I said to them, those egg cartons need to disappear. And a month later they were gone after they'd used up the what they had in the supply. But you can't put a picture of chickens on pasture if they're not on pasture. They were cage free, but you can, it's false advertising. You've got to do what you say you're doing. So you need to think up a special kind of lamb. Okay, what would be a lamb equivalent to certified Angus that does something kind of special? And then you start selling that product. I was raised in New England. We had lamb every week. But there's a lot of places when I went out to the University of Illinois, nobody ate lamb. In Illinois, they go, Ugh, I like lamb. Lamb with mint chili, I love it. Okay? Of all the livestock handling videos and, and seminars that you've done, which one, what, what species or what did you enjoy the most, and where do you think you made the biggest impact within? Well, beef has been the one I've worked on the most. You know, the beef slaughter plant probably the most, then pig slaughter plant, and then I. Uh, when I first started out, one mistake I made is I thought I could fix everything with equipment. What I have learned, I can fix half the problems with equipment. The other half is the management. And when we started uh, doing the McDonald's audit, scoring them with the five simple scores, plus no actual abuse, 
I saw more change in 1999, it was all written up in Journal of the American Veterinary Medical Association papers, you can get them on Google Scholar. I saw more change when we held them to those numbers. And we took some of those older clients, and with simple fixes like lots of foreign, that was a big one, changing life, training people, bring less animals up at a time, bring 14 cattle up, not 25. You know, just simple stuff like that, getting hot shots out of hand, get your mouth shut, stop yelling. It was amazing the improvements that that made, holding them to those numbers. The equipment's, equipment's half of it, the other half of it is the management. But I find too often people want the thing, the magic drug, the magic computer or something, they want the thing more than they want the management. Well, I had my center tractor strainer system was on the beef plant video tour. And we were putting those systems in all through the early 90s. Half my clients tore it up and wrecked it. Then we start the McDonald's on it. Broken side adjuster, you get it fixed. Uh, so they're slipping in the stun box, non-slip floor. Simple changes, lots of repairs. You know what the number one cause of bad stunning was in beef in, in when I did the baseline data? Broken stunning equipment that only hit with half power because it did not maintain it. That is a management issue. That's in a paper I've got in 1998 in the AVMA journal, an uh, objective scoring paper. Broken equipment that shot at half power. They simply didn't take care of it. And that's a management issue. I was surprised at that, but that's what I found. And we just went through there just repairing a lot of equipment and and management had to get behind it. And out of 75 pork and beef plants, only three had to build something expensive. And three plants had to have a manager act to me. Nothing, <laughs> nothing changed until we got rid of the plant manager. This is Dr. Brandon. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank for the work that you've done on the videos. I teach at a small university. And we watch a lot of your videos. It gives me a chance to show the students what's, when things are done right, how it's really done in modern processing plants. And when we did those videos, we didn't go picking over the footage to pick out like the show sheep or the, um, the best cattle. Those were shot quickly in one day. We just went in there, whatever was there, we shot it. And then when we went into the sheep stockyard, I saw sheep in there uh, chewing their cuds. I said, get a picture of that. They're chewing their cuds. I don't think they think they're going to get slaughtered. I mean, that's the sort of thing that we need to be showing. And we just went through there and filmed the sheep that were there. It's been very good and very educational for our students. The university I teach at, we have just a general ag program, and we get a lot of non, what you wouldn't consider traditional ag students in that program. A lot of them are coming from backgrounds looking at specialty ag and all of this, and one of the challenges I have is trying to expose them to what is the reality versus what they learned on social media. Well, that's just before. it. Do you have any indications, that especially the industry, and what, how we can try to combat and make sure that our the correct view, the real real view is? Well, that's the reason to put the put the videos out there. And there's some animal rights people that they called me bad things like a Nazi and stuff like that. I uh, yeah, somebody took some of my um, my slides and spliced them into the concentration camp pictures. Uh, yes, I get, I've been bashed on both sides. It's not, that's not fun. I, well, that's the reason for putting the videos out there, is to get, uh, the, the turkey ones turned out to be the real popular one, because the turkey one, the very beginning of it, you know, some people have said that you go to the turkey bar, the turkeys are afraid of people. I said, these males are displaying to me. They're fluffing up their tail feathers to show how beautiful they are because they want to mate with me. <laughs> Don't think they're crazy. <laughs> There's a whole barn full of male turkeys. That's what they were doing. One more. Simple messages, simple messages. All right, let's give a simple message. All right, how many people here have a Facebook friend in a major city like Denver, Chicago, or something like that? Okay. Oh, good. You're doing better than other places in the heartland on that. Because I've been in some other places where in a school with 150 people, uh, there wasn't one Facebook friend in a major city. What? Remember, what's chores to you is interesting to people in the city. 
Let's just start communicating with your Facebook friends in the city. All right, lambing. This is lambing. This is shearing. This is uh, taking a sheep to another pasture. Just showing what you do and explaining. And there are some people, like there's a feedlot lady that has a blog that communicates to the public. Start some blogs aimed at the you know, school kids and things where you just talk about what I do on my sheep farm. That's the, it's just going to start with things like that. And with today's editing tools, well, if you don't know how to do it, let the kids be tech support. Kids are tech support, grown-ups do content. <laughs> kids can do all your tech support for you. And, and uh, just start putting things up, putting it out there. This is what we do. This is how we take care of the land. And then uh, encouraging your friends in the city to you know, share it. And they like clever, clever stuff. You know, they, there's certain pictures that will just go viral. Well, I like that you can answer a question before it's asked. That's definitely for a sound bite that we could take home with us. Thank well, you. that's something you can just take home with you and start doing and just showing things. But well, here we are lambing on our farm and you know, we're moving our sheep up to another pasture. And this is why we move our sheep to another pasture. Talk about things you're doing for the land. And, uh, and the other thing is we have all this land and the only way we can raise food on it is grazing animals of different types. And that's something that really came to me when I was in this plane looking out at the outback over nothing and a pilot yakking on my iPhones. It was this crazy iPhone on the dash. And he's, yes, yakking away. And I'm watching his GPS and his altimeter. <laughs> um, but other than that, it, it, it's really weird. The beast, you, you will not go in an airplane here unless you're over the mountains. Sometimes I get on a flight where I get a window seat, like a New York to Denver, and I can see the ground the whole way, where you don't see any signs of civilization. You know, was once we got outside of Darwin, we were two and a half hours, I didn't see a power line, I didn't see a house, the road was under just because the plane just followed the road. But other than that, nothing. It's like a mind blower. And all you can raise, raise on that sheep and cattle. That's what you can raise on that land. What are we gonna do, not raise food on that land? That doesn't make very much sense to me. See, and I think those are some of the things we need to be telling people. Also, it's food security to have um, animals grazing on this land. You know, one of the reasons why Europe subsidizes small farms, they've starved. They don't want to do that again. That's why they subsidize small farms. Japan does the same thing. They starve. That's not a place you want to go. But just start, you know, communicating with them and, you know, cute pictures of lambs and uh, things you do to take care of your animals. So remember, what's chores to you is super interesting to school kids and courage to, you know, share your experiences. Also, let's talk about the values, the Charlie Arnott values. You can say, yes, I'm a mom. I, we eat our own lamb. We're really interested in wholesome food for our kids. That's shared values. And that's something that's very, very, that resonates with young consumers. You know, we care about the land, we care about our animals, we care about feeding our family wholesome food. And I think, Len, with that, thank you very much. <laughs>